chapter number, uh, I'm sorry, Mark, Mark chapter number five. We was in Matthew last week. Mark chapter number five, and uh, we're going to start reading in verse about 25. Uh, we are so glad to have you here today. Amen. I know that uh, sickness and everything and um, been so much in the church and so much in your families, and we just thank God for you here today, this morning. Amen. Uh, I want to preach to you a message this morning that uh, the Lord laid upon my heart last week before uh, the last Sunday sermon. This one uh, is coming to you uh, from uh, a point of view as in the healthcare world. Last week I was uh, very um, impressed with modern science and modern medicine, but at the same time, I begin to realize that no matter what we could do in the medical world, there was no um, overcoming death. There's no overcoming this uh, physical nature that we call death. Amen. Uh, I was looking at some of the machines and some of the people and some of the professionals that were in working uh, upon a patient, and I began to realize that there's no greater health care in the world, no greater time in all of history has mankind put every bit of his knowledge, every bit of their understanding and their mechanical aptitude into keeping people into a life state, and yet we come so short. No matter what we did that day, there was nothing that worked. And finally it happens, uh, it's a fancy word, it's called DIC, disseminated intervascular coagulation. They bled to death simply because their blood cells begin to break down. And I began to reflect upon that, and the Lord laid upon my heart this passage of Scripture to preach to you a message that's kind of out of the ordinary, and simply is this, is that the cure for your life, the cure for your life. Now, I, I do want you to know that uh, we all are in need of some type of healing, aren't we? I mean, you, you think about it. If you've got cancer, you want healing from the cancer. If you have heart trouble, you want uh, healing from the heart trouble. If you have diabetes, you, you seek out doctors that will help you with your diabetes. And doctors do the best that they can. And oftentimes, we come to ourselves and we begin to believe that doctors have a plan, a pill, or a procedure that will cure us and cause us to live forever. Now, the actual person in America does not, and I know this from 36 years of healthcare uh, living, the average person in America does not plan for, deal with, or mitigate their end of life. It's meaning that we kind of uh, keep kicking the can down the road and that we think that we're going to live forever. And if forever is not forever, then at least at 62, I think maybe I'll get ready to die at 72. And when I get to 72, I think that I'll get ready to die at 82. And we're always thinking that it's down the road, but oftentimes we have to deal with our own death and what is it that we need. Well, I'll be honest with you today. Doctors have failed you many times. Uh, doctors cannot do anything other than what they do, which is prolong the inevitable and the inevitable is that we are all, according to Hebrews chapter number 9, uh, we're all appointed once to die. Amen? And I hear it all the time. And, and, and it's in some of the most stressful situations. Uh, a, a husband will say to the doctor, what more can you do for my wife? There's got to be something. I want to transfer somewhere else. There's something in, in Chicago or something in New York or something in Los Angeles. There's something somewhere that can make her better, that can extend her life. And my friend, oftentimes at the end of life, we get these last grasps for life, and I see it all the time in the pain and the anguish and all the things that come from that, and it's absolutely heartbreaking to the medical world to say this is all we have. We don't have any more, and, and so it, it gets kind of uh, to the end of that, but not only that, but I want you to know that health care is the number one financial burden in the Americas of today. Financial burden of health care right now, the average person that is working a 40-hour work week, uh, those that are, are holding a job, trying to keep their insurance, trying to get everything done, health care is the number one burden that puts upon the strain of your finances in your home. Amen? Health care has soared. The average uh, MRI right now, for you to go have an MRI, if you paid it out of pocket and paid the asking price, would be about $9,000. 
And you get about a 15-minute MRI that's read by a five-minute doctor, and then they give you a diagnosis that will move you down the road, and it just wipes you out. That's why the number one reason that uh, people are going into bankruptcies in post-COVID is because of medical financial overload. And uh, every one of us are that way. Sheila and I, we, we deal with that as we're in our 60s now, and we begin to realize that, hey, we're living longer, but are we living better? And if we're living better, we're going to be a debtor to the hospitals, to the doctors, and to all the medical technology. And I know you feel the same way. What is it that is the ultimate cure for what ails us? Now, I want to tell you that I'll be the first to tell you I, I'm not promising you a physical cure. I'm not promising you that you're going to be cured after you hear this message. I'm not promising you some kind of uh, magic formula that's going to give you the one, two, threes or the ABCs of how to get a miracle to, for your health care. I want to tell you, I believe in miracles. I've seen them. I know that God still touches in the medical world. I, I still see those. But I do want you to know that God does not guarantee you or me a miracle when it comes to our physical health. Amen? And, and so when we come to a place and a passage of Scripture that kind of deals with what is the cure for our disease. So turn with your Bibles, Mark chapter number 5. I'm going to start reading in verse number 25, read down to verse 34, and I want to give you just a few short things about the ultimate cure in your life. Amen? I hope you've got your copy of God's Word. Uh, Mark chapter number 5, verse 25. Read with me if you will. There's a certain woman which had an issue of blood 12 years. And they had suffered many things of many physicians and had spent all that she had and was nothing bettered, but rather grew worse. When she had heard of Jesus, came into the press behind and touched his garment. And for she said, if I may touch but his clothes, I shall be whole. And straightway the fountain of her blood was dried up. And she felt in her body that she was healed of that plague. And Jesus, immediately knowing in himself that virtue had gone out from him, turned him about in the press and said, Who touched my clothes? And his disciples said unto him, Thou seest the multitude thronging thee, and, and sayest, Thou, Who touched me? And he looked around about to see her that had done this thing. But the woman fearing, and trembling, knowing what was done in her, came and fell down before him and told him all the truth. And he said unto her, Daughter, thy faith hath made thee whole. Go in peace and be whole of thy plague. I want to preach to you a message this morning about this woman and her ultimate cure. Now, I want you to know that there's a physical story, but there's a spiritual application. In fact, the Bible cares more about your spirituality than it does your physicality. The Bible is all about your eternity, not about your earth being. Amen? I, I do want you to know that. Paul says that we are just strangers and pilgrims passing through. When we are born with our first breath, we set upon ourselves a clock, a timing that we take our last breath, whether that is a few years, whether that is 50 years, or whether that may even be 100 years. But there is that sense that the earthly is going to pass away. Paul said that this earthly tabernacle will pass away. So therefore, we look at the physical explanation and we learn the spiritual application. Amen? And that's what we're going to do. Look in verse number 25. I want you to see this woman's diagnosis. Well, her diagnosis is important in that it's just not any diagnosis. It is the ultimate diagnosis. This is the one diagnosis that I can guarantee each and every one of you have and that I have. It is that her diagnosis is mine and your diagnosis. Look what it says in verse number 25. The Bible says this, the certain woman had an issue of blood. It is significant here that, that Mark writes to us, gives to us the absolute, absolute number one thing that is going to cause our death. What is that? Are you going to die of heart disease? No. Are you going to die of lung disease? No. Is cancer going to take you? No. What is the one diagnosis that spreads throughout all of humanity? It is simply this. It is a blood disease that you cannot change. Amen? 
Now, now this woman here is given us as an example, and the Bible kind of relates to it. It doesn't specifically say, but that it says something about Menoresia. Uh, it says something about her being a woman. It says something that about her being an adult. It says something about her uh, having anemic uh, dispensation. But all these things show and point to one particular thing, and that is that we all have a blood condition that is terminal, amen? If I said to you that every one of us has leukemia, you would say, no, pastor, that's not right. But if I say to you this, that you have spiritual leukemia, I can guarantee you that you do have that one, amen? Leviticus chapter number 17, verse number 11. The Bible says this, For the life of the flesh, the earthly flesh, is in the blood, and I have given it to you upon the altar to make an atonement for your sins. What is it saying? Her diagnosis is mine and your diagnosis in that our blood has a disease that we call sin. When Adam sinned in the Garden of Eden, the DNA of mankind went from perfect to polluted. When Adam sinned, instead of being a, a blood that was always regenerating the body, it was a blood that degraded and destroyed the body. When Adam sinned, God said his blood was no longer, uh, Adam's blood was no longer going to replicate and refresh and replenish the human body. And in fact, in Genesis chapter number three, God says, you will surely die. And so therefore, the Bible is very clear that her diagnosis in verse 25 is our spiritual diagnosis in that each one of us has a terminal disease and it is a blood-borne disease. It is a disease that man cannot cure. It is a disease that cannot be uh, medicated. It cannot be medically managed. It cannot be moved over or moved out. It is one that is 100% lethal and there is no man-made cure for what's going on in our spiritual lives. Amen? And so there Therefore, we see how deep and how dark and how uh, deadly this disease is to this woman. In verse 25, it says that she had a disease and it was an issue of blood. Her blood was infected. And as infected, her symptoms were that she was bleeding to death. Amen? When we look spiritually, we are spiritually bleeding to death. Amen? There are people right now that are walking around with a deadly blood disease called sin, and they are slowly but surely bleeding to death in their life. They go five years, ten years, an entire lifetime, and they slowly, slowly, slowly become more and more spiritually anemic. And they become to a point to where they have no power, to where they have no purpose, to where they have no life within them. And they ultimately die in their blood disease. And their blood disease is one that there is no human cure for. This woman, she inherited this blood disease. I, I've already told you this, but I want you to see it. Romans chapter number 5, Paul writes these words. In Romans 5, 12, he says, Wherefore, as by one man, that's Adam, Sin entered into the world. How did sin enter into the world? Disobedience to God determined that mankind would die. How is it? We looked at Leviticus 17. It is the blood of humans, the blood of man, the blood of Adam that sets us into a disease that is going to ultimately cause our death. Wherefore, as by one man, sin entered into the world, and death by sin. So death passed upon all men. I told you up front, her diagnosis is your diagnosis. She has a disease of the blood that's going to kill her. You have a spiritual disease of the blood that left untreated is going to kill you. Amen. It passed upon all men for that all have sinned. Her diagnosis is your diagnosis. Theologically, it's called the edemic DNA. Edemic DNA is, uh, uh, like I've already said, is that Adam, when he sinned, God separated him, separated himself. God changed uh, his perfectness, uh, Adam's perfectness, into now that was polluted because sin brings separation from God, and separation from God always ends in 
death, always ends in uh, disease, always ends into that event that we call death. And so therefore, we see that in Genesis 3, that we begin to have a disease that was passed genetically from person to person. Some people pass genetic tendencies and traits for diabetes. Some people have genetic tendencies and traits for such things as arthritis or heart disease or, or dementia or whatever they may be. They have found the genetic codes and the genetic markers that when they sequence just right, these diseases will manifest themselves. Not all the time do they manifest themselves in the DNA. It depends upon the strain and the coupling, and then it begins to manifest itself, and oftentimes it'll jump generations. It'll go from daughter to granddaughter or daughter to great-granddaughter. It jumps until it sequences just right. Those are, 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 are what we call disease processes. Well, my friend, there is one that genetically programmed that is every one of us has, and that is her diagnosis is the disease of the blood, and our diagnosis is the exact same thing spiritually. We are destined to die because we are genetically programmed with a disease that will bring about our death, and that is sin. Amen? I, I mean, you see that. It's, it's a diagnosis of death. So number one, I, I want to say that the cure, number one, is that we all have a disease because of the diagnosis. Number two is that her disappointments are our disappointments. Amen? Look at verse number 26. In verse number 26, she's got the diagnosis. She's got the diagnosis, and now she lives a life of disappointment because of the diagnosis. Look what it says in verse number 26. It says, and, he, and had suffered many things of many physicians, and had spent all that she had, and was nothing bettered, but rather grew worse. Amen? Her disappointments are our disappointments. And in this passage of Scripture, in verse number 26, I want to give you just a few things about her disappointments. Now, we're talking physically in the narrative, but we have to apply and we have to pull from that our spiritual lives and how that we are affected because Jesus writes this, Jesus gives us this, and this story is ordained for us to learn a spiritual truth. And I want to show you her disappointments, and then I want to parallel that to our disappointments. Amen? Now, first of all, I want you to know, uh, amen, that she had some physical disappointments. Amen? Physical disappointments. We know that from verse number 25, that she had an anemic condition for greater than 12 years. Now, an anemic uh, a position for 12 years is lethal. What happens when the red blood cells do not build themselves back? And by the way, it takes about 120 to 140 days to build one red blood cell. So if you kill a red blood cell or if one dies, it takes 120 days to go from a, a, a new blood cell to a mature blood cell that will do the things necessary to keep you alive. And this woman has been losing more red cells than she's been making, and over those 12 years, she has had some physical signs and symptoms. Some of those are that she is constantly fatigued. Can I get a witness? Amen? Some of you girls, uh, uh, women especially, because uh, of your structures and because of all the hormones, you produce red blood cells at a lower rate than a male would do. And you know better than most that anemia is something, as you get older and older, that you have more and more of a propensity or a, a, a sense of having to go through. And the number one thing that you can always say, that I always listen to, that I always hear, is that I just feel like I can't even lift my head. And you have that constant fatigue. You all have shortness of breath. Why is that? Because when you lose blood faster than you make blood, then you're losing the ability to carry oxygen. Your lungs may be fine. You're breathing in oxygen. But if there's no hemoglobin to grab the oxygen out of your lungs and take it to your cells, then you are running kind of in a negative. I, I use this illustration all the time about anemia and how it makes you feel. Every one of us knows what an old coal lamp is, right, an old coal lamp. And you know how you light the lamp and you trim the wick and you put the globe on, and you've got that uh, wick adjustment. If you uh, raise the wick too high, it begins to soot the globe. Amen? 
And that's what happens is that you are burning energy faster than you can get oxygen to it, and your system starts to shut up. And so you start getting short of breath. You get fatigued. You get short of breath. Your heart is always working harder because it's trying to move more blood to get more oxygen, but it never can catch up. And so you are constantly feel like your heart's running away. Amen? And, and then last, you start having organ failure. Now, long-term organ failure you don't see in a day. But if you are constantly anemic, if you are constantly have a lower blood count than you're supposed to have, then over years of time, you are absolutely, and, uh, and unfortunately, you are destroying the core organs, the heart, the lung, the kidneys, the liver, all those things. They begin to die. And this woman is one that her disappointments was that she's experiencing all these physical attributes of being without blood. Amen? Now, spiritually, we get the same way. We, we start getting shortness of breath. We, we're not able to have the stamina to stay in the fight or stay in the ministry to keep things going. We are constantly feeling fatigued all the time, and we just get overwhelmed with the simplest of things to do, and we just get to a point where we just are dying inside. Why is that? It's because we don't have enough of the blood of Jesus spiritually flowing through our body to make us new, healthy, and be able to go, right? And you say, well, Pastor, I thought the blood of Christ can. Yes, it can. Amen? It's the blood is available, but are we applying it? And so, therefore, it is one of physical. But let's go a little bit further. Can you imagine 12 years of being anemic? Amen? I mean, that's, that messes with you. I, I, I can get a cold for three days, and I think I'm dying, right? I can get a cold for three days, and I can be laid up on the couch. Miss Bonnie, I'm going to kill on myself. I, I can lay there and just, uh, oh, I'm dying, and I've got the rags. You know, I can't even hit the trash can with them anymore. I'm just letting them go wherever they want to go, and I've ate so much chicken noodle soup, my sodium level is way up, and, and Sheila has to do everything for me. That's the way it kind of is, is that we get so uh, overwhelmed, amen, because we don't have oxygen to the brain when the constant pressure of being sick, the constant pressure of impending uh, death and dying, hopelessness and helplessness. For 12 years, this woman has had physical symptoms, and she's had psychological symptoms, and now she's got positional symptoms. What, what do you mean, Pastor? Look, if you will, in verse number 27. I'm sorry, 26. It says that she uh, was one who had not gotten any better. And what does that mean spiritually is this. Now, you go back to Leviticus chapter number uh, 25. Leviticus, or I'm sorry, Leviticus 15, I think it is. Leviticus 15 says that uh, this woman was ceremonially unclean. And you just read past this real quickly. You think, oh, the poor woman, she's bleeding to death. It's more than that. Psychologically and positionally, she has been excluded from her family. She has been excluded from her community. She has been pushed out of her church. The temple and the court of the women would not allow her inside. There was nothing she could do. She was so secluded that she was almost just forgotten about. Amen? And, and I, the Bible tells us in Leviticus that they would just set food and water and then that they would have to walk a furlong, which is about 1,600 feet away from her, before she could come and receive what little bit you gave her. Amen? Her family couldn't be with her. Her, her husband, if she had one, couldn't be with her. Her community had exercised her. Everything was just going wrong for this woman. Her disappointment was terrible, and it was something of that. But it goes a little bit further. It, it, insult to injury is that she was extremely poor. Look in verse number 26, the last part. It says this, that she had spent all that she had. All that she had. Amen. What does that mean? That she wasn't rich to begin with, by the way. Uh, but everything that she had to cure what she had was killing her was taken from her. This woman had no hope whatsoever. Amen. Uh, it, it says here that she had been 12 years. I can't even go to a doctor 12 times without filling it in my back pocket. Amen? Uh, can you imagine 12 years with many physicians? That's just not one doctor. But she got all of them, and she was poor, poor, poor. Can you imagine more of a disappointment and a disappointing life? 
My thing is a lot of people that live that kind of disappointment because they have this issue of misdiagnosis. Amen. I, I, they, they're drug addicts. I, I've often wondered, I've often stayed awake at night, I've often gazed into the heavens and wondered why do they keep doing what they're doing? They have no hope. Amen. Why do alcoholics keep taking bottles? They have no hope. Amen. Why do people keep in the same lifestyles that they have? They have no hope. They get to a point in their life where they are so spiritually anemic that they feel like they're going to die and they cannot move. They are absolutely beyond uh, movement, and that's the way they feel. Have you ever been there? I have. Amen. Years ago, I have. Amen. So spiritually drained, so spiritually cast out, so spiritually darkened, so spiritually feeling that I was spiritually dead, that there was no hope, there was no help for me, and nothing could fix it. Amen. That's what this woman went through. Amen. This woman ripples up the salt. The diagnosis of sin, the disappointment of separation from everything, from life itself. But is there any hope? Well, I'm glad to tell you that there is. Amen. And we're going to find the cure. Now we're getting to the sermon. The cure. Amen. What is the cure? Let's look in verse number 27. In verse number 27, we start to see the cure for this woman. And not only the cure for this woman, but the cure for mankind. The cure for this woman is found in verse number 26, or in 27. Look what it says. When, when she had heard of Jesus, amen, when she had heard of Jesus. Now, my friend, I want to tell you something that the doctors didn't change the way they were treating her. The, uh, the priests didn't change the way they were treating her. Uh, the people around her didn't change the way they were treating her. She had nothing else going for her but this one simple thing. When she heard of Jesus, amen, when she heard of Jesus, she got that light of hope. Jesus said, I am that light set up on a hill. Jesus said, I am the bread. Jesus said, I am the water. Jesus said, I am the life. When she heard of Jesus, her life began to change. Amen? When she heard of Jesus, her life began to change. I want to say to you today, that is truly, when we start getting the diagnosis of death, when we are so disappointed and despondent, my friend, the one thing that we need to do is to make a decision to hear from Jesus. Amen? Her decision was that she heard from Jesus. But look, she came in the press behind him. What strength she did have, she made the effort to move to Jesus. Amen? So many people today uh, can't feel like that they can come to Jesus. Don't we need to take Jesus to them? Uh, so many people feel like they can't walk. Maybe they need to crawl. Amen? I remember that morning uh, at Philadelphia Baptist Church, whenever I got saved, amen, I did not feel that I had any hope that morning going into that building. But my friend, when Jesus, when I heard Jesus speak to me, and I said, "What, Lord, whatever I've got left, I'm going to give to you. Lord, that's what I was. That's when my life began to change. When my life began to change was that when I heard Jesus and I moved towards Jesus, and the Bible says, and she touched his garment. Amen? His garment. Now, what was the uh, importance of his cloak? Externally, it was nothing. It was made out of, of either goat's hair or camel hair or some uh, uh, rough weave uh, material. It was nothing to look at. So, therefore, we have to look past what the coat was and realize what the spiritual significance was. What is that? Christ. The Bible tells us in Revelation chapter number 19, verse number 11, that we will put on the coat of his righteousness. 2 Corinthians chapter number 5, verse number 21 says, But God hath made him, Christ, to be sin for us, who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of Christ, or righteousness of Christ in him. We put on the righteous robe that Jesus Christ gives to us. Amen? And when we are put on the righteous robe of Christ, we are uh, covered uh, symbolically in the Old Testament by the blood of Jesus Christ. You remember, as uh, I believe it was, the, the high priest once a year, he would put on the robe of the high priest, and he would go in, and what would he do? He would sprinkle the blood. And so therefore, what we see here is that when she made the decision to hear Jesus, and she moved to Jesus, that she touched his garment, his garment, was the righteousness of God. Amen. The only way to be cured is this process. Hear 
the Holy Spirit. Hear, come, heed, hold the righteousness. So many people need to hear this in their life. Amen. You need to hear this in your life. Amen. You say that, that you need a decision. Her decision was in verse 27 that she would go to Jesus. This morning, what's the problem? Go to Jesus. It, it may be that you have a physical ailment. Maybe you have an emotional ailment. Maybe you have a spiritual uh, problem. What's the answer? The answer is, as it's always been, you have to go to Jesus. Amen? There is no other uh, life. There is no other way. There is no other cure. There is no other one. Jesus Christ is the one who is the healer. Amen? He is the healer. Amen? The Bible tells us in the book of Isaiah that by his stripes we are healed. Now, does that mean physically? Yes. Does that mean emotionally? Yes. But ultimately, if you'll look, the, the stripes of Christ in his physical body, they all hold spiritual application. Amen? He was bruised for our transgressions. Amen? That's a spiritual thing. Amen? He, he was taking uh, all the things in Isaiah. And so, therefore, this woman comes for a physical healing, but she winds up now demonstrating to us that there's a spiritual cure for deliverance. Last thing, and I'll close this morning. Look in verse number 29. Amen. In verse number 29, we see that she was delivered. She was delivered simply because she had made the decision to come to Christ. Amen. And the Bible says this in verse number 29. And straightway the fountain of her blood was dried up, and she felt in her body that she was healed. Amen. I, I want to tell you something today. Uh, so many people say, well, I just don't feel saved. Amen. I, I want to tell you, the Bible tells us in 1 John chapter number 5, verse number 13, Amen. these things I have written unto you that you may know that you have eternal life. How do you know that you have eternal life? Number one is that the Holy Spirit speaks within your heart. Number two is the Holy Word of God. Amen. And number three is that you are a changed or new creature according to 2 Corinthians chapter number 5, verse 17. Behold, all things are new. All things are made new. Amen. I, I want to say to you today that you can know that you've been delivered. Straightway, the fountain of her was delivered. Now, she was delivered in such a way that her diagnosis was defeated, wasn't it? Amen. The Bible says very clearly in verse number 29, the fountain of her blood was dried up. What does that mean? That God changed the coagulation, that God changed the condition, that God changed and gave her the cure for her blood condition. The blood of Jesus Christ changes our condition. Amen. We go from death to life. Amen. We go from disease to health. We go from uh, wanting to being healed. And my friends, so many times we negate or we miss the opportunity for God to touch us because we're looking for something physical. But more importantly, God is looking for to change us spiritually. Amen. If I live to be 110 years old, Pastor, and I don't know Jesus Christ, all I've done was live as a dead man 110 years. But if I know Jesus Christ, the Bible tells us that if I die today, how can I live again? Amen. Paul says it, it is gain for me to go. And so many times we get so uh, focused on the, this finite, the where the, in our world, we all want to live forever. There's an old song that says everybody wants to go to heaven. Nobody wants to die. Amen. None of us want to die. But I do want us to understand and to uh, focus on the fact that this woman teaches us this spiritual fact. Her deliverance was declared and it disappeared. Her deliverance was given to us and to show us that Christ can deliver us from the ultimate disease or diagnosis. Now, let's close this thing up. What was it that she thought of? Her diagnosis was our diagnosis. It's a blood disease. It's a blood disease. Amen? And she had disappointments. Don't we all in our, in our spiritual lives? Amen? But we make a decision for Jesus Christ. And then ultimately, we can be delivered. Would you bow your head with us, please? Sheila, Connie, as you come, I'm going to ask you, uh, Sheila, maybe you could sing that song, The Stain of Blood. Amen? Um, I did leave out one thing.
You know, we, I talked earlier about how that pharmacies and physicians and all these things, we, we put a lot of stock into these things. And a young lady taught me something a couple of weeks ago. Uh, she said to look up the word pharma or pharmacy or physician in uh, the original language. And I did. You know what pharmacy or pharma means, big pharma? It means to enchant, to entice, and magic potion. Amen. Those pills that I just know is going to cure my aching back. Amen. Those pills that we take for our diabetes, does it really cure anything? No. No. It, it may prolong our death, right? It, but it never cures anything. Medicine doesn't cure anything. Amen. Praise the name of God. What cures? Blood of Jesus. Right? Would you stand on your feet? Let's be uh, in prayer. Father, we come to you today. God, we ask you, Lord God, that you watch over us and keep us. And Father, that through the story of this woman, Lord God, that you have shown us a spiritual application. Lord God, though the diagnosis may be death for our physical body, you said that you can raise us again into life. Father, though in the physical sense we have disappointment in our health, Father, that you can heal us spiritually, emotionally, and yes, even physically. Father, we pray, Lord God, that you would give us a decision to follow you. And Father, that we would reach out and touch your righteousness. Father, Lord God, that we would just put upon the cloak of righteousness and be that great witness that you'd have us to be. And God, we thank you, Father, for the deliverance one day where this body, this mind, and our eternal soul will be made new. And forever we will rejoice and we will praise you. And we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Good luck.